Uh, good evening. My name is Uta Poigen. I'm the Dean of the College of Social Sciences and Humanities here at Northeastern. And it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you in the audience here in West Village, as well as all of you who are watching tonight's panel on Russia's invasion of Ukraine online. And uh, we will have the ability um, to have questions and a conversation with all of you in the audience, as well as with those of you who want to ask some questions from the live stream as well. Uh, you can probably hear that I sport a German accent, and indeed I grew up in Germany, and I want to just um, give a few thoughts. I just came back from um, Germany on Sunday, and so was in Germany um, as the invasion started. And like I'm sure all of you, I'm very struck by the quick shifts um, that we are seeing, as well as the many references to history that we are seeing. Um, as well as uh, just the incredible amount of suffering um, that uh, we are not fully um, really seeing. And I'm very grateful um, that um, five of our colleagues are engaging in a conversation with all of you about this conflict and about its implication um, for global politics. In Germany, of course, it was very striking that the German government um, changed long-standing um, traditions of not intervening in the aftermath of World War II and the Holocaust in active conflicts. It's also very striking um, from the perspective of someone who has uh, studied um, Central European um, history and international conflict that there was such an outpouring as there is here in support of Ukraine, in support of re refugees, and that in context where there's long histories of racism, often racism directed from Central Europe towards areas um, further east. So without further ado, um, again, a warm welcome to all of you. Let me turn over to our moderator for the panel of this evening, to Tom Vecino, who is an associate dean in the College of Social Sciences and Humanities and who is here in his role as professor of public policy and political science. Tom, to you, and again, thanks to all of you, especially thanks to you, Maya, for pulling our colleagues together for this important conversation this evening. Thank you, Dean Porger, and welcome. It's great to see so many familiar and friendly faces here in the audience and to actually see some faces. So let me echo Dean Porger's comments and really welcome everyone today to our engaging conversation we have with this important discussion with a distinguished panel of faculty experts. It's great to see so many of you here today in West Village on our Boston campus. Let me also extend a warm welcome to our students and colleagues in our global campus system for joining us today virtually on live stream from Seattle to San Francisco to Vancouver to Toronto to Charlotte to Portland and across the Atlantic to London. And I should say, and beyond. And so let me just welcome all of our colleagues here on Boston, too, who, who are joining us virtually. Today's conversation focuses on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm sure by now many of you have seen the harrowing images of war-torn cityscapes and landscapes across Ukraine. My colleagues today will help us collectively interpret what these events mean for global politics, for citizenship, for people, and ultimately for democracy. I want to briefly reflect on our role during uncertain times. Just last night, buildings across our campus here in Boston were illuminated with blue and yellow lights in solidarity with the people of Ukraine. Last week, students mobilized on our campus on Centennial Circle to also voice their support. And around the world, from Berlin's Bradenburg Gate to New York's Empire State Building, images abound of global solidarity. In fact, people from around the world have expressed their right to the city to support democracy and human rights. As President Joseph Owen reminded us last week on Friday, our university's mission is shaped by reason, fairness, the pursuit of knowledge for the benefit of all humankind. These principles exist in stark contrast to authoritarianism, suppression, and brute violence. In that spirit, let's begin our conversation. We are joined today by four internationally recognized experts on these issues, including Dr. Maya Cross, who is the Edward Brook Professor of Political Science and International Affairs, Dr. Katia Bochkovar, who is Associate Professor of Criminology and Criminal Justice, Dr. Simon Rabinovich, who is the Statsky Associate Professor 
of Jewish Historical and Cultural Studies, and Dr. Serena Perrick, who is Professor of Philosophy. We'll begin by opening remarks from each of our four panelists, and then we will open up for conversation with the audience. Dr. Cross, let's begin with, from your perspective as a scholar of international relations and the politics of Europe. Can you set the context for the understanding of the geopolitical landscape that led to the invasion of Ukraine? Thanks very much, Tom, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, so I'm going to try to very briefly set some of the context and explain some of the significance of, of what's going on. Um, so it's significant to have Russia invade Ukraine because for quite a while now, war has been thought, war of this fashion has been thought to be obsolete on the continent of Europe. Um, for almost 80 years, there has been peace. And to a certain degree, there's been a sense of taking for granted that you know, there would be peace in Europe, that the problem was essentially solved. And there are several reasons for this. Um, the process of EU integration itself, economic interdependence, the general decline of Russia, the fact that nuclear weapons seem to provide some sense of deterrence. Um, so all of these things really kind of converge and really, up until the invasion, made us take for granted the idea that there would be peace in Europe. And, and now it's kind of a wake-up call. It's, it's really a shock to the system, despite the fact that you know, we had the intelligence and we could see the troops kind of preparing for this invasion for several months. It is a shock, and it, it has extreme relevance to, to the nature of global order going forward. It's not just for peace in Europe and sort of this threat to the EU integration process. It's also something that strikes at the heart of the liberal world order more generally and the survival and, and sovereignty of democracies. And it's also something that really threatens global order, even beyond the liberal international order. So, you know, there has been since World War II a set of international norms that people have accepted that you don't simply aggressively attack a neighboring country to take territory by force. And now this has happened, and um, the kind of norms of decent behavior in the international system are a bit up in the air. I wouldn't necessarily, though, paint a completely negative picture here, because norms don't just evaporate, especially strongly held norms. They don't evaporate because of one person or one country violating them. It's how we respond that matters. So, just briefly, how did we get here? And is it really NATO's fault, as Putin claims? Is it really because NATO has expanded? And I would just kind of remind all of us, talking about you know, the track record of, of Russia over the past 20 years, that actually Putin was getting closer to the West, really. You know, up, up until around 2008 or so, he was engaged in close discussions with Western leaders. He was in a, a kind of partnership with NATO. He was actually cooperating in many ways in joint military exercises and tackling challenges around the world with NATO. Um, even after the 2008 invasion of Georgia, there was still this effort to create a strategic partnership with Russia. So NATO you know, was actually enlarging. And even after that happened, Putin was close to the West. And that's important to remember. Um, NATO is defensive. It has not threatened um, Russia. That's not its purpose. Um, so I think that in some ways, the fact that Putin focuses on NATO is a bit of a red herring. I think what's threatening Putin is a bit more related to his fears of losing power domestically and the idea that there's this clear attraction from the West, Western values, democracy, opening up the post-Soviet states are headed in that direction to varying degrees, and that is concerning to Putin. So, so far, the Western response, um, for me, actually, not too surprisingly, but really in a very unprecedented way, is to come together very, very closely in economic terms, in military terms, and political terms, um, short of you know, sparking some kind of greater European war. We're seeing a very, very strong response with strong Western alliances the most punishing sanctions um, in history to some extent, uh, a total kind of reversal and, and transformation of some of the European um, willingness to act militarily, especially with Germany, as Dean Poiger mentioned. Politically, diplomatically, we are seeing countries all over the world, not just in the West, 
stand up and condemn Russians, Russians' actions, even China starting to move away. So Russia is isolated. And then finally, the war itself is not going you know, as well as Putin thought it would go, and even as well as some Rush, um, American intelligence experts had expected. It, there's a de de devastating humanitarian toll, which I know my fe fellow panelists will talk about. But in terms of what Russia and the military actually expected in terms of this takeover of Ukraine, the, the forces have been stalled. Um, so in desperation and weakness, we now see this bombardment of civilian areas, civilian, um, even humanitarian corridors, uh, which is uh, really horrific to watch. It's a clear violation of international humanitarian law. So I think the next few weeks are going to be really crucial in terms of where things go from here. Thank you, Maria. I'd like to turn to um, Katya now as a scholar of gl both global criminology and someone who's actually conducted research on the ground in Ukraine. I'd like to ask you to reflect on the human impacts caused by war. Katya. Thank you, Tom. Um, I would like to talk about the impact this war has and will have on civilians. And um, we know that uh, about 1.7 million people have already crossed borders from Ukraine to other countries. And we know that more people will do so in the near future. And it is understandable why this is happening. Every day, people in Ukraine are being bombed, shelled, and killed. So the toll that this war has already taken on, this, on the population of Ukraine is immense. And when we talk about the impact that the war has on people, we often think about food and some other uh, commodities that are missing. But we also think about the war trauma, the direct war trauma that people experience. And for many of us, it's um, being injured uh, themselves or watching somebody else being injured, uh, witnessing bombings, and so on. But there are actually other types of war trauma that also matter and that also result in all the negative consequences that we would normally associate with war trauma. In order to explain how that happens, let me backtrack a little bit to the year 2014, when the Crimean Peninsula, the chunk of Ukraine, was annexed by Russia. And about the same time, the war in Donbass region of Ukraine, in the eastern part of Ukraine, started uh, initiated by the pro-Russian separatists and counter um, faced by the uh, Ukrainian state troops. The war was ravaging, it was horrendous, it took away thousands of lives, and it gradually slowed down from the truly ravaging conflict to the slowly burning but steady war in the region. So about two years into that war, my colleagues from the University of Miami and I decided to ask ourselves, what, would, what is the impact of this war on Ukrainians? What is happening in the country? And we focused on the people who were both displaced um, from the Crimean Peninsula or from the Donbass region, as well as those who stayed um, on the ground and never really moved anywhere. We took the measurements two times with a survey conducting this in 2017 and then 2019. So we did it twice, and we uncovered several important things. First of all, aside from the direct war trauma that we typically associate with war, there is also indirect war trauma. And it comes from the stories of the war being told to us by the, our loved ones, or watching the news about war being so close in the media. And people actually uh, traumatized both directly and indirectly experience high levels of PTSD, high levels of depression, high levels of anger. And as a result, very often they experience heightened levels of violence. Um, and it's important to think about the indirect war trauma as something that basically sneaks up on the, upon people. They don't realize that this is happening. But truth be told, they're actually struggling to make the ends meet. They are struggling to um, uh, compete for resources. And as a result, they feel angry, they feel upset, and they actually engage in more violence. Furthermore, we also found that even indirect war trauma 
is associated with the change in the moral compass for some people who basically engage in the process of moral disengagement and no longer what they thought was wrong is wrong to them. So some of them actually feel that it's okay to be violent, at least under certain circumstances. So all of this is important because now we are no longer talking about the war in Donbass. We're talking about the war that's ravaging the entire country. So anything that we found back then has to be multiplied by 100, 1,000 times. And we're talking about the people who need both short-term and long-term support. Many of the people who are now crossing borders have already been displaced once by the previous war, and now they are actually being displaced again. So as a global community, we need to be mindful of that and to think about ways in which we can be supportive of these people, both long-term and short-term. Thank you. Thank you, Katya. Simon, I'd like to turn to you to, as a historian and, and scholar of the region, focus on what the role that historical interpretation plays in shaping the current conflict today. Well, thanks, Tom. And um, as you said, it, it, it's played a surprisingly central role in the conflict itself. And I would argue that historical interpretation is actually driving the conflict. Um, and this is uh, this is true for both uh, the Russian and the Ukrainian side. Um, on the Russian side, uh, it's historical interpretation that is forming the justification for the war itself. The, the casus belli itself is that the Ukrainian government is a Nazi regime and that the, um, its military is made up of Nazis and these are not meant as uh, metaphorical Nazis or as a matter of speech, but as literal Nazis. Um, and that's the way it's being sold to the Russian people. Um, this has a lot of resonance to Russians because the historical experience of World War II and the defeat of fascism is, I would say, the central, the central pillar of, of post-Soviet Russian identity. Uh, you can see this in common rituals today. One example would be that it's still the case that uh, newly married uh, couples within Russia visit the monument, the local monument, or a flame to the unknown soldier uh, from, from World War II on their wedding day to place flowers there as a token of respect for the dead. Um, so. This is central to Russian identity, and so um, as a formation of the justification for the war, uh, it's very effective. Um, and, and like I said, it, it's important to take seriously this use of this term Nazi because it's meant quite literally. Um, the other aspect in which it, it forms a justification for the war um, is something that we can see in the speeches that Putin and his associates, his very close associates, have been making at least since 2014, um, and the arguments they've been making with world leaders about the illegitimacy uh, of Ukrainian national identity and statehood uh, as a essentially a creation of the Soviet Union. Um, now, unlike the the first part about the Nazis, which I, which had to be constructed, and and I'm dubious about the extent to which people believe it, or rather have convinced themselves to believe it. Um, in the case of this questioning of, of you, the legitimacy of Ukrainian identity and statehood, it, this is a closely held belief uh, of Putin and his associates. Um, and for the, the reasons for which uh, I, would be, I would be happy, um, happy to get into in, in the question and, and answer, all I would say is that Ukrainian national identity and the desire among some, but not all Ukrainians, for uh, an independent political uh, entity or an autonomous entity or some sort of uh, political, politically independent future predates the creation of the Soviet Union. Um, and the fact that the that Ukrainian uh, the the create current create. Ukrainian political 
state that exists and create and Ukrainian national identity is a product of the Soviet experience is something equally true for every uh, political entity to come out of the Soviet Union, every republic, every federation, including the Russian Federation. Um, but on the Ukrainian side as well, history is shaping decisions that are being made um, because among Ukrainians, uh, especially Ukrainian speakers, the association of the Soviet historical experience is one of political repression, famine, genocide, and general victimhood. Um, and so naturally, that's an experience that is shaping their own decisions about Ukraine's future in terms of political integration and security alliances. Um, and so history is very much at the center of this conflict, um, but not, it's not merely in the background, is what I would say, is that in order to understand the actual decisions that people are making on the ground that, are, that is creating the war, one has to also understand that, that the interpretation of, of, of their experiences within the Soviet Union are, are central to that. Thank you, Simon. Finally, Serena, I'd like to turn to you. As a philosopher and someone who has studied forced displacement, can you tell us about the refugee crisis that the invasion has caused? Sure, thanks, Tom. Uh, and it's great to see everybody today. The refugee crisis that the invasion of Ukraine has created has been one of the most troubling aspects, to say the least, of the invasion. So it's only been going on for a little over 10 days, so under two weeks. And in that time, a little bit more than 2 million people have been uh, displaced from their homes and able to cross a border into another country. And that's important because that's what makes somebody a refugee. So we have 2 million refugees outside of Ukraine, as well as with hundreds of thousands of people displaced within Ukraine who are not formally considered refugees, but are also in desperate need of help and protection and all kinds of aid. Of the 2 million refugees who have crossed a border, 1 million of them are children. So this refugee crisis is unique in that the refugees are almost entirely women and children because Ukrainian men are um, forced to stay in Ukraine um, because of the law that was passed there after the invasion. So this is a very interesting situation for a number of reasons. The, the sheer number of people leaving a country is nothing that we've seen in recent history. Um, if anyone is familiar with the Syrian civil war, the number of refugees who came from Syria into Europe was claimed to be an overwhelming number. But in fact, 2 million is how many refugees came from Syria over the period of three years. So just to keep in mind, that's the number of people who have left Ukraine in the last 10 days. So it's an extraordinary number of people, and as Katya said, experiencing all kinds of trauma. To give you a sense of what a refugee from Ukraine might be going through, a common story that I've heard is something like this. People start hearing bombs going off, going off outside their buildings. They realize that they're very close, so they go to a bomb shelter. And they maybe grab a few things, maybe their toothbrush and you know, a stuffed toy for their child. But they realize they can't go back. So they go from the bomb shelter to their car, to a train, to a bus, however they can, and they start this long journey out of the country. So remember, they have nothing with them. Because people are leaving at such a high rate, it means that it's, it's extraordinarily difficult to leave. Initially, people were able to get out in a fairly orderly way, but very quickly, within a few days, people were lining up for hours. I heard upwards of 70 hours in order to leave Ukraine and be processed largely in Poland by the Polish government. So these refugees are desperate to get out. They can still hear bombs going off as they're fleeing. And in a way, you hear stories about them getting over the border. And this is the first time in days that they're able to take a breath. And then, of course, they break down and realize all that they've lost. Um, all, so, so it's an extraordinary experience for the people of Ukraine. And the conflict is just beginning. So we anticipate even more refugees leaving in the short term.
That's the bad news. The, the more positive news is the reception that Ukrainian refugees have been receiving, um, particularly in Eastern European countries. So the vast majority of refugees are going to Poland, Hungary, Romania, Moldova, um, countries which are on the border of Ukraine. And they are receiving them with, with open arms. Refugee children are being met with people in, um, you know, in, in police uniforms, handing out chocolate bars to children as they get off trains and as they arrive to be processed in Poland and Hungary. And people are showing up to offer people rooms to stay in, um, food, making them, you know, bringing all kinds of food, making soup, um, doing whatever people need to help them when they first arrive. And the reason this is so incredibly striking is because it stands in such stark contradiction to how refugees from Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan in particular were received after 2015 into Europe. Initially, there was a little bit of support, but very little in Eastern Europe. Um, you know, Poland, which has now taken in over a million refugees, as, as recently as two weeks ago, was still constructing a border wall to prevent uh, largely Middle Eastern European, sorry, Middle Eastern refugees from coming through Belarus. Hungary would use, you know, guard dogs and pepper spray and other deterrent devices to prevent refugees from coming through Hungary to get to uh, Germany and Sweden. So they were very, very anti-immigrant and very hostile, both at the level of the government and at the level of everyday people. And now we see this turned dramatically on its head. So it's very, very heartening to see that this attitude is possible, and it's possible for a very large number of people. Um, I'm, I'm happy to talk more about why this difference is in place, despite the incredible challenges for these countries in receiving refugees, if, if people are interested. But it, but it has been very, very um, inspiring for many people to see the um, compassion and the solidarity with which refugees are being received in Europe and all over Europe. Thank you, Serena. I'm too reminded today that it's International Women's Day and we saw it commemorated in the Northeastern News this morning and just thinking about the, your poignant description of the impact, particularly on women and children, um, I think is an important theme for us to return to. As we wrap up though, I wanna briefly turn back to Maya to reflect on sort of what's next. And as we do that and hear from Maya, I invite the audience to think about some questions. We'll have an opportunity. We'll have two colleagues here, Rachel and Gabby, who can pass around the microphone and we'll, we'll collect some questions and then moderate that conversation with the panel. While you think about that, Maya, can I turn to you to reflect on what's next? Sure, thanks, Tom. Um, well, it's a really precarious situation that we're in right now, globally. So I think there's two things I would point to to pay attention to. One is the danger of miscalculation and human error as we see you know, all of this conflict close to the borders of NATO countries. Um, and another is just the question of how far Putin is willing to go. So I would just outline three possible scenarios for the future without kind of necessarily taking a stand on, on what will really happen since no one can predict the future. But the first scenario I would say is a, is a kind of protracted new Cold War of some sort. Um, so clearly Putin is adamant about trying to topple the government in Kyiv and to sort of claim some victory over Ukraine by possibly putting in a puppet government of some sort. It's unlikely he'll be able to hold that very easily, but regardless whether he sort of leaves Ukraine in shambles or tries to kind of stick it out there, there's going to be continued sanctions and possibly the danger that Putin is replaced, which could be a helpful situation. Um, but given Russian nationalism and other factors, it's likely there will still be this bad relationship ongoing with the West and a sense of unsettledness with uh, Ukraine and of course the humanitarian disaster continuing with that. The second scenario, and so I'm just going to get worse from there, the second scenario is a possible World War III, which I think we need to look at in, in the next few weeks. Um, it's a dramatic term, of course, but by that I essentially mean that either through purposeful aggression from Moscow or um, from sort of accidental miscalculation, other countries beyond Ukraine get dragged into this war. And so that would involve NATO. And even um, non 
NATO members of the EU are protected by a mutual defense clause within the EU, which is akin to Article 5. So that would immediately bring in the US and Europe in what would essentially be a world war. It, it might still maintain itself as a conventional war, but things would play out very quickly from there. Um, and the third option is actual nuclear war. Um, and here we really do have to consider, again, miscalculation and how far Putin is willing to go, especially if feeling backed into a corner, feeling that it's hard to declare some kind of win, maybe using tactical nuclear weapons at first. Um, nuclear weapons in Russia can reach the United States, and we could be in a situation in the most pessimistic scenario of trying to prevent mutually assured destruction. And um, it may sound a bit far-fetched. I think people in Europe are taking this uh, possibility um, perhaps a little more seriously than here in the US. But Lavrov has, has um, literally said that a third world war would involve nuclear weapons. And Putin very early on has threatened their use. So those are just um, three possible scenarios, food for thought, as we kind of now start discussing the situation. Thank you, Maya. Wow. So on, on that note, I'd like to invite members of the audience to uh, raise your hand. And we'll collect uh, in, in probably three questions. And then we'll, we'll put that together to the panel. Uh, when you have a question, I ask that you state a concise question that ends in a question mark. And also, please let us know your name and affiliation. We'll collect a couple of questions, engage the panel, and then we'll also we'll have an opportunity to turn to our guests who are here virtually as well. So we'll. Hi, uh, thank you for being here today. My name is Jonathan. I'm a business student at Northeastern. Um, so my question is, uh, is there going to be a larger push for energy independence for the US, do you think, in the future? And uh, in the short term and in the long term, will that look like? Will it look like uh, more offshore drilling, more fracking, or would it look like uh, uh, green energy renewables? Thank you, Jonathan. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. That was a very interesting experience. Uh, my name is Ivan, uh, first year uh, econ political science uh, student here. So uh, it is undoubtedly that uh, this conflict uh, created another source, another meaning for existence of a NATO as a defensive structure. But NATO largely is a European and uh, North Atlantic alliance, European and uh, North American alliance. So what will be the net NATO precautionary moves in Asia with China, which has a very um, big interest in Taiwan, in uh, South America with, with Venezuela, uh, which is affiliated with Russia, and in Africa with the countries of BRICS and South Sudan. So uh, the question overall is, when this conflict sparked in Europe, NATO is going to, might go uh, defensive, but without uh, its ability to act outside of Europe, how it will counter the threats that will inevitably, that might occur in Asia and in South America and in Africa. Thank you, Ivan. We'll collect one more and then go to the panel. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Michael Ambrosi. I'm a mechanical engineering student here at Northeastern. Uh, I was wondering, what do you think about the possibility of the refugees who are coming from Ukraine sort of staying in Eastern Europe uh, and maybe even hoping to head back into the country through some kind of resolution uh, versus them being distributed out to European and other Western allies uh, as what happened with the Syrian refugees. Thank you, Mike. So we've heard three questions that, that touch on both population concerns, economic concerns, and political concerns. So I'll turn to the panel to first, I, I think, tackle the, the question of economic concerns around e, uh, energy independence. Sure, yeah. I, could, I could start with that. Um, thanks very much for the great question. Um, I think because the nature of the sanctions so far have been so focused on everything but energy, and the sanctions are powerful and effective, 
the question though is what about energy? So I think this is really where we are at this point. And you might've seen that today Biden announced that the US would now be sanctioning in the energy sector. So in effect, it has take, taken a step forward beyond the Europeans at this point. But today as well, the Europeans announced what they will be discussing in their summit on Thursday and Friday, um, which is to really kind of look at how to reduce reliance on Russian gas. So they have a proposal already to reduce reliance by two thirds of what they currently rely on and to phase out well before the end of the decade any reliance at all. Um, so to answer your question of what then will shift here, um, I think the US and Europe are probably on similar paths here, but the focus would be on renewals, renewables and trying to kind of build up, especially with the UN climate change report last week, to go faster towards uh, being carbon neutral. But that's not something you can really do overnight. The Europeans will be focused a lot on solar in particular. Um, so at the moment, there are actually talks going on with American leaders and other countries where they might replace those energy sources they would normally get from Russia. But there's no question that taking on this particular step with the sanctions means that you know it's this, the sanctions are not necessarily only or primarily hurting Russia, but they're starting to also take a toll on Americans and Europeans and others who've issued uh, these sanctions. So I think that's very much next. I wouldn't be surprised at all if, if Europe joins the US, especially in oil, um, as the first step, because this is where more of the profit is um, for Russia. And then for this question, if I can continue on NATO, if that's, <laughs> I don't want to. Um, dominate, but it might be more efficient to go quickly into the NATO question, which is also a great question. Um, so yeah, of course, NATO's design is, is completely defensive. And up until um, the last few years, you know, there, there weren't even any significant troops at all that were kind of at the border or close to Russia or even in Eastern Europe, just a very um, light amount of, out of troops there. So it, it starts to kind of ratchet up to deal with Russia. And then the question is the rest of the world. Uh, so Article 5 does not get invoked in the rest of the world, but I don't think that this means that the alliance is irrelevant. I just think that probably the actions to kind of deter or to deal with security conflicts in other areas of the world would be based on other international organizations like the United Nations. Um, but I think, you know, we're still in a world where the use of force is a last resort, and I do stand by my initial comment that you know, the way that the West has responded to Russian aggression helps to uphold that norm. I don't expect kind of repetition of this kind of conflict, for example, with China and Taiwan or in other parts of the world, just because Russia has kind of paved the way in a sense. Um, so, you know, we would expect more kind of economic responses, again, if, if these threats came up, more diplomatic responses. And I would not expect anything to kind of replicate in the same way because the, the severity of, of those types of responses are now very clear. Um, this is why we see China now kind of trying to back away a bit from, from what Russia has done. So Western alliances are important in any context, but you know, NATO has really been about defense in Europe and then humanitarian operations in other parts of the world with the sanctioning of the UN to, to go on those. And, and I, that's what I would absolutely encourage, this emphasis on the UN going forward for whatever region of the world that you're talking about, and then operating in alliances to the extent possible. Thank you, Maya. In terms of the future of where refugees will go, I wonder if we could turn to perhaps Serena and then Katia to comment on uh, what, what, what does the future hold for refugees Sure. Uh, most refugees from Ukraine today who have crossed into Eastern Europe hope they can go home soon. In the best case scenario, if the conflict turns out to be short-lived, a few weeks or even a few months, they hope to be able to return as soon as possible. And remember, families have been separated, so fathers and husbands and uncles and fathers are still behind. And so they want very much to be able to return home. So. The future of refugees will just depend on how the conflict ends up playing out. In the best case scenario, it's short-lived and people are able to return home. In the worst scenario, the, the conflict either drags on or the Ukraine, it, or Ukraine is occupied or, and 
as Maya mentioned, if there's a nuclear disaster or some other kind of nuclear um, explosion there and it's unlivable, people will not be able to return home. And then we'll have to deal with the larger question of which countries are going to be willing to resettle large numbers of refugees. Right now, the European Union has been extraordinarily hospitable to refugees. Uh, in the US as well, there's a very positive sentiment towards refugees. But we'll see how that ends up changing as larger and larger numbers of refugees um, come out of Ukraine and then how long they end up being refugees for. As you mentioned, right now they have a legal right to stay in the EU for up to three years with the right to work and to access social benefits. So, so we'll keep an eye on that, and that's the, the only way we'll be able to know what happens will, will depend on how the conflict goes. Katya? Yeah, I think Serena pretty much answered this. Uh, it, it depends of, to a huge extent on how long this war will take. It would the, the extent of the destruction of the cities that we are already witnessing, like Kharkiv and many others. And I know that uh, all of these people really want to go home. Uh, they want to rebuild their state. They want to rebuild their country. They want to uh, be uh, united with their husbands, fathers, brothers, and so on. And so um, the, the, the desire is very much there. It's, it's just it's something that's uh, unfortunately out of anybody's hands at the moment. Thank you. Let's go back to the audience for another round of questions. Hi, um, I was wondering how you guys mentioned um, how Syrian refugees, roughly three million of them have come in, but it took a three year span to let them in, yet the same amount of Ukrainian refugees have come in, but it's taken like a, 10 days, I think was said. What is, what is fueling that? Thank you. Hi, um, uh, my name is Maria. I'm doing the master's program in uh, security and resilience studies. Uh, along that line, I wanted to ask, uh, this was not a scenario I think most people were considering. We didn't believe Putin would invade Ukraine. So uh, at this point, you can't, I, I mean, I don't think we can assume it won't happen again in other countries like Kosovo. We, we don't know if maybe Serbia can get this courage from the Russian government and invade Kosovo. We never know. So I was wondering if uh, I don't think countries were resilient to this type of uh, aggression. I think that... Um, uh, my question is, if NATO should now focus on getting those partners and even their member countries being more resilient to this type of aggression or activities and all this, because wars are evolving. So I guess that is my question. Thank you, Maria. Hi, uh, I'm William. I'm a computer science and physics major here. I was hoping that you could discuss the role that civilians have been playing in this conflict, both on the Ukrainian side and on the Russian side, whether it's played a fundamentally different role compared to other wars, and whether they will actually be able to make a difference, uh, potentially cause some change in the Russian government, something like that. Thank you. Thank you, William. Thanks for these great questions here. And um, I wonder, Serena, if, if we could have a quick follow-up about refugees and um, of the time span of those population shifts? Sure. So the, the time span is, is um, very dramatically different. But if I was understanding the question correctly, it was more why was the difference? Um, when Syrians came in, even in the first year, there were about a million Syrians that, that entered through Italy and Greece and, and tried to get to Germany and to Sweden and other countries in Europe. And they were met with hostility, with dogs chasing after them, with people on you know, chasing after them with sticks, with governments putting in policies that were absolutely cruel. There, nobody was greeting them with, you know, chocolate bars and helping them find a place to live. There's, there was a lot of um, resistance to refugees. So ultimately, about a million and a half Syrians ended up in the European Union over this period of a little over a year before deterrence policies were put into place so that more Syrians couldn't come into Europe. And why, why, is that, why is that? Why now are people so open to refugees in a way that as you know, just a few weeks ago, they were very, very hostile towards refugees? 
I think there are a few explanations for this. Uh, many Ukrainians feel a deep sense, or sorry, many people in Poland and Eastern Europe feel a deep sense of connection to Ukrainians, both historically, because there are these deep historical connections. They know what it's like to experience Soviet aggression and to live under Soviet occupation. In many cases, you know, parts of Ukraine were Poland up until the Second World War. So there's um, a, a deep commonality that causes people to look at Ukrainian refugees and say, they are like us. They are our brothers. We, we have to take them and we have to help them. The more negative way of thinking about it is to think about it as embodying a kind of racism where Ukrainians are seen as um, white, European, and to quote an uh, infamous CBS news reporter, relatively civilized. <laughs> that quote managed to offend both everyone outside of Ukraine and Ukraine. <laughs> They think of themselves as, in fact, civilized. But it really reflected this idea that um, people who were white, it, it was unbearable that they could be refugees, whereas it was normal for um, people from the Middle East and from Africa to experience war and to experience trauma. Didn't quite deserve the same response. There's also a sense that, well, Syrian men are potential terrorists, and they're violent, and so forth, and therefore they're a threat to us. And this is also based in very deep racialized stereotypes around violence and around crime um, that are not borne out by the facts in any way. So there's, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of reasons why we can understand a positive affiliation for people in Eastern Europe towards Ukrainians. And we can also see the, the we can now see clearly, I think, the racism that was at play in the response of many European countries and their governments to refugees from the Middle East and from Africa over the past few years. Thank you, Serena. I wonder for Mariana's question, if we might go to Simon first and then perhaps to, to Maya to focus on really the legitimacy of, of, of Ukraine as a state and what Putin actually hopes to gain in this decision. Yeah, sure. Um, for, for the student, um, hear about the question about reevaluation um, of NATO's goals or, or various European states' goals of defense. I, I think this is one of the great ironies. And you know, I, I, I'm trying to keep to my disciplinary bias of reading the past and not the future. But, but one of the, the great ironies, of course, and, and I think bad gambles of the war itself is that it is achieving everything that supposedly uh, was the aim of preventing, uh, that, that Putin aimed to prevent um, uh, in terms of uh, um, the alliance becoming more united and boosting defense spending and countries that had been neutral taking a more uh, aggressive stance um, and so on. Um, you know, I, I, which is why I actually think that it's, it's not about that so much and uh, that it's about these historical interpretations. Uh, more, but I, I think there's no doubt that it'll have that effect. Um, but for the student in, in the territory that I'm more comfortable with in terms of uh, the past um, and the civilian participation, which is really a, a, an, an excellent question, um, well, I, I would say that uh, of the many, many things that have surprised me in this uh, conflict, yeah, the level of, of civilian uh, participation in Ukraine um, towards the defense of Ukraine has has been impressive. Um, and there is no doubt that um, Ukrainian civilians are invested at this point with their lives um, in defending the sovereignty of Ukraine, um, including many millions of Russian-speaking Ukrainians who have been turned into Ukrainians by this conflict. Um, and that I think is has it was I would not have predicted. Um, and in terms of of what's going on in Russia and the role of civilians in uh, in Russia, it's a lot more complicated, or it's equally complicated, I would say. Um, but a, a couple of things. First, it on a personal level, it the level of sanctions that are being imposed on Russia. I take no joy in because I have Russian friends uh, and colleagues and associates who are in a position to suffer, um, who will suffer 
uh, from the political repression, who will suffer financially from their savings being wiped out, who will suffer from, who are already suffering, who have disappeared on Facebook. Um, so I, I, and that's not just about sanctions, but of course the political repression that's, that's having at home. But yet at the same time, I, I fully support throwing absolutely everything uh, that we have economically at Russia right now, um, rather than holding, waiting, holding on to any possible aces in the hand um, because of the lack of predictability of civilian populations. And the reality is that whatever we may hear about uh, Russian support for Putin or his policies or the closure of information and access to information um, that people have, yes, when they can't fly out of the country, when uh, they, they can't shop at Ikea or use their Visa or MasterCard, they can't watch their, their favorite soccer team, um, and they have absolutely no savings, they may very well first blame the West, and I think that's, that's, that's probably what's going to happen. But at a certain point, you don't care who's causing it. Um, you want change. Um, and that's why, why I, do, I do think that it's a form of communication, essentially, to um, the population at large that is clo closed off from information that, you know, it's not, it, that, that there's got to be something behind this. Um, and, and I think that, that it's necessary and that, that I think that it is whatever people tell you about polling, it is very difficult to predict how the winds might change. Um, and I'm not, uh, I, I tend to be un, very unconvinced and, and, and without offending the sociologists and the political scientists on the panel, I tend to be very un, generally unconvinced by the predictive value of, uh, of theories, political and social theories. But there is one that, that, that I do think holds fairly true, which is called relative deprivation, right? Which means that people get used to a certain level of living, right? And when it is taken away, si situations become unstable, right? So, you know, there are historians who have looked at this and, and political scientists and sociologists are looking at, at at medieval Europe even and saying, well, you know, in places where people are used to 500 calories a day are more stable than places where they're used to 1,000 and it gets reduced to 750, right? Um, and I, I think with the level of unity of sanctions going on right now, it is impossible to predict how the civilian population in Russia is going to respond. Um, thanks for the questions. I just want to add a little bit on to uh, Serena's question about the refugee situation and comparing it to Syria. I think, you know, she's right to point out that it's complex, and I would certainly caution against boiling it down to racism. I think there are a lot of factors going on here, but there's also a lot of differences in the two situations, right? So in the case of Syria, the refugees have to cross over water, which has resulted in, you know, some of it means it's slower, it's a more treacherous trip, there's more death and sort of um, people just not being able to handle the trip. And, and so it's a very uh, difficult kind of journey, whereas now we're seeing a matter of kind of taking a train or walking across a border into another country, which is allowing the speed to be a lot different. But there's also a situation here in which, you know, with 2014, the protests in Ukraine and the taking of, of Crimea, um, the EU was supporting a country that had people in the streets waving EU flags. They were trying to push back against Russia because they wanted to be part of the EU. So the EU has a special responsibility here to help the people in Ukraine, and particularly as this crisis ramps up so quickly and so many people need to flee for their lives. In the Syrian situation, as it rolled out more slowly, and, and at first the EU also threw open its doors and said, please come refugees, um, you know, we're here to welcome you, and so many flowed across. It did mean that other people who did not count as refugees also came, but it also meant there was time for the, pub, the, the political system to react to this. And so you started to see actually in, in a couple of years a threat to the very 
European integration project itself as the far right parties rose and um, the leaders of the EU were thinking, how are we actually going to continue with this project, which is about peace and democracy? Um, in this very different situation with Ukraine, you have people willing to die for democracy, waving EU flags who are adamantly trying to, you know, they've even applied for EU membership. So there's a sense of responsibility there that I think is important to note. And in both cases, at least at first, the EU threw open its doors. As far as this um, NATO situation, um, the question about, you know, should NATO start kind of helping other countries become resilient because these threats may spread, I would actually place the emphasis more on the EU than NATO. So NATO has a very specific purpose, and again, it's for defense, right? Um, whereas the EU is a very comprehensive kind of international cooperative organization that involves the economy, that involves human rights, democracy, social standards, um, any policy you can think of is part of the EU infrastructure. So in terms of resilience, that's where you find it, not so much in a kind of um, sort of defense organization. And so I think it's not um, you know, any mystery why suddenly uh, Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine said let's become, let's submit our applications for EU membership. Uh, it's not something that can ho happen overnight, but I would actually hope that at least for Ukraine, it can become a candidate pretty quickly. When that happens, there's a whole um, kind of flow of, of aid and sort of help institutionally and all sorts of other things that can occur to help these countries um, really sort of stand up in the face of Russia. So for the civilian role in Russia and Ukraine, I think that's a really interesting dimension and very, very important with Ukraine, you've actually seen the, the army grow by one third because they were able to um, allow in volunteer people who, who didn't really have much training in military, but were able to get light training and reservists. And suddenly the military was a lot larger, but also civilians, of course, are armed and trying to fight and protect um, their city. So this is v the very source of why Russia has not been able to do what Putin said would be so easily done. He thought that people would welcome Russia to some degree. It's, it's quite <laughs> the opposite and almost delusional. But um, with Russia, I think, you know, with Simon, there's some hope there that the civilians will realize that the, the war is not going well, that Putin is not able to kind of strut on the international stage and pretend to be you know, the leader of a great power, and that this might be some sort of source, especially amongst the oligarchs and the business elite, to kind of topple Putin. Um, if it can't happen sort of now-ish or soon, there is an election in 2024 as well. So there, of course, it's an authoritarian country, so elections may not mean anything. But I think you know there, there are these um, opportunities that the civilians hold in their hands to change the course of what happens here. Thank you, Maya. I'd like to now turn to our guests who are visiting or, or joining us virtually. And so, uh, Jen, could I turn to you for some questions from the chat? Yes, we have a couple um, questions from the chat. Jess Leary writes: Is it possible the current transact? I'm sorry, the current sanctions imposed by the West will actually strengthen Russia's economic efforts with allies to the East? If so, to what extent? On another local scale, EMB writes, how can academic institutions provide aid to Ukrainian refugees, students, scholars, artists, writers, et cetera? What are your recommendations for Northeastern's role in this crisis? Thank you, Jen. So we have a, a first question is about the impact of sanctions and the role that they might play in, in shaping behavior. That seems like Maya's territory, but <laughs> Maya, do you have so, a so the question is about whether the sanctions are sort of working and whether um... it's. I think it's a contrarian position of, of of whether the sanctions on Russia may actually create an alternate economic union that 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 economic okay. integration of Russia will will move eastward. I assume towards China, India. Uh, and other allies rather than the West. Okay, yeah, I mean, I think that we have a globalized economy and Russia is really sort of trading with a lot of different partners. It would, it would be difficult to just sort of um, 
kind of turn east to other partners, particularly since a lot of the, the potential eastern partners, maybe with the exception of China, are also not happy with Russia's actions. So I think um, that is unlikely. And even if it were able to be set up in some way, it would not replace um, you know, the lack of trade with, with the West and the rest of the, the international system. So we're already seeing the effect. It isn't even something we have to guess about, right? So the ruble is tumbling in value, and um, the economy is crashing. The stock market is sort of shut down, and already people don't have access to to basic goods, and the army is not going to be financed much longer. So um, I think that there is no real strong alternative for Russia. Uh, and the sanctions are, it, as long as they stay in place as they are, um, the sanctions are going to gradually make Russia look more and more isolated, even economically, and possibly a little bit closer to countries like North Korea. I mean, it's it's really, it, it'll take a while to get there, but it's it's quite isolated at the moment with the sanctions. I actually wanted to, you know, add a little bit to this and cross over to uh, the previous question about the role of civilians uh, in this. There is a very popular notion spread by the Russian media right now that um, the the unity with China, you know, the projected unity with China will help it uh, persevere and survive, you know, regardless of all the economic difficulties. And I'm sure that there is a, a significant uh, proportion of the population that, that may uh, buy into this idea at the moment, but um, uh, there is not a good chance that this will last very long, and ultimately, um, the uh, relative deprivation will kick in. Um, particularly, you know, with the scant reports of uh, how people are doing on the other side, you know, somewhere else outside of Russia. Uh, Russia is getting more and more isolated right now, and um, there are there are uh, the numbers that they provide, you know, at this point in time, uh, presumably in support of uh, the current, you know, the war and, and Putin's uh, political line, uh, show anywhere from you know sixty to seventy five percent, but. Um, we also have to be reminded of the fact that, you know, the, the former dictator of Romania, Ceausescu's um, uh, political um, polls would show about 99% support, and he was arrested the next day. So. I don't think anybody actually, we haven't addressed the question of what Northeastern can do, and, and uh, as an institution for, um, uh, to 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 help scholars, I suppose, and other academics in and students, I would say, in need. Um, well, we can uh, um, we can create uh, employment opportunities um, for people who have no university anymore. Um, uh, so opportunities for students who have no university anymore, um, and. Uh, it's above my pay grade, but but that's something that can be done on an institutional level. I guess the, my uh, the, the 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 thing that I would add to that that I, I think that we should be um, mindful of is that um, Russian academics are uh, and students are also in danger, um, and we should resist. And yes, I'm, I'm not drawing an equivalence between the danger of your university's uh, department physically being destroyed by a cruise missile, as happened with the sociology department in Kharkiv. This is not a, um, uh, an equivalency. Um, however, um, I, I have colleagues who, who there's no doubt that their personal safety is, is in danger because they have spoken out. And, um, and, and I think that, that that is also something we should be mindful of, of providing opportunities for, too. So just to add on to that, in addition to the Ukrainians who fled the country, about 400,000 foreign national students were studying in Ukraine. So these are students from India, Bangladesh, uh, Nigeria, Yemen, Afghanistan. And they have mostly been asked to return home. But in principle, they could have been offered places at universities in Europe or in the United States to continue their studies in recognition of the harm that was done to them by the, by the invasion. And, and if I could interject, the, the thing that I like people to turn their attention to, if, if you think, what can we do to help Ukraine? There's, there's absolutely a lot we can do. 
And it's going to be a long term. If you're interested in Ukrainian refugees, they're going to need help for a long, long time. But I would also encourage people to just keep in mind that this is one refugee crisis among many refugee crises in the world. And I hope that if people can look at refugees from Ukraine with a sense of solidarity and compassion and understanding of what it means to flee with nothing but your toothbrush and to be separated from your brother and your husband and your father, that we'll be able to see that in other refugees from Haiti, from Central America, who are more immediately asking for help directly from the U.S. and that we're in a better position to be able to, to aid. So, so there's a lot I think that people can do if, you, if we want to stay engaged and stay active. In part two, I would go back to the, the, our framing comments from Dean Borger and, and, and myself and, and the special role that universities play in fostering this dialogue and getting involved in particular a place like Northeastern where our experiential mission gets us out into the community, into the news. All of our colleagues here today are, are experts that are sought after to help shape that public discourse. And so I would say that coming together in these types of community forums is important. But it doesn't stop there. So getting involved in politics and, and shaping public policy is equally as important. And, and students in your generation, I think, will play a key role moving forward in getting that involvement and taking it to the next level. And so I know we're just about at time here. I might turn to Maya for one final wrap up in terms of um, where you see uh, this conversation going next here at Northeastern. Yes, I mean, I think that we should continue having a dialogue. I'm hoping actually to maybe do a follow-up panel in the coming weeks where we can continue to examine these issues uh, from different perspectives. So one of the great things about this panel, I think, is that we just we all have very different areas of expertise. So we're able to lend a different lens to all of this. And for you who are students as well, I'm sure you're thinking as well. That we could talk about, for example, um, cyber attacks as well and the cyber side of things and there's just a whole range of things. I'm also kind of doing some work on will the International Space Station continue to exist if Russia pulls out, um, you know, this wonderful achievement of international cooperation. So I think these are very difficult times overall in terms of figuring out what's next in terms of the international order. Um, but it's important that we just we stay as informed as possible and to and realize that you know there's there's a lot of force for good going on alongside this tragedy. The very fact that so many countries are condemning Russia's actions is a reason for hope at the end of the day. Thank you. Please join me in thanking our panelists today. Let me just extend a special thanks to everyone who joined us today virtually in our Global Campus Network and everyone for coming out today. And to our staff who supported this event in the College of Social Sciences and Humanities, thank you all. Take good care.